Welcome back, everybody. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking, this may be a bit of uh, deja vu for you, but we're going to be talking about policing in the age of ubiquitous mobile media. So that's quite a, quite a title to unpack. Uh, policing, I imagine we have a sense of policing. Ubiquitous, if something's ubiquitous, it's, it's everywhere, uh, it's abundant. And then mobile media. Uh, can anyone give me some examples of uh, what, 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 what would you define as mobile media? Cell phones. Yep, yeah, great. Cameras. Cameras, yeah, like a, a, a point and shoot camera yes, sure. that just takes photos. No or videos. Yeah, videos. oh yeah, videos, good point. Mm -hmm. Online communication, do you know? Online communication. Oh, online communication, yes. Yeah. Um, anybody here have a, a mobile device that they're uh, on them right now that's capable of capturing photos, yes. audio, video? Any okay? Yeah. Yes. And uh, but no one's filming me at this moment. Then okay. <laughs> I was gonna get my hair cut before this uh, trip, but it didn't happen. So uh, hopefully uh, I'm doing all right in the hair department. Uh, before we get uh, to ubiquitous mobile media, I'd like to go back. It's uh, hard to imagine, but next year it'll be 25 years uh, since the uh, Rodney King incident and the Rodney King video. Um, and I want to start with this bit of, uh, of, of media history because uh, this was likely recorded on a traditional large format VHS camera um, and uh, the other thing that's important to note here is that this was recorded by um, an average resident of Los Angeles. It wasn't mainstream media, it wasn't the police, um, it wasn't a journalist, it was uh, just a, a local resident that happened to observe this traffic stop um, where the Los Angeles police um, pulled over Rodney King and uh, used excessive force uh, on, on King. Now, the reason that this is uh, unique in terms of the history of mobile media, this, this, uh, this artifact, is that it was a, really a pre-internet um, uh, sharing of, of citizen media. 1991, there, there was an internet, but in terms of uploading and sharing video, particularly from a VHS analog camera, uh, was not really something that was accessible and certainly wasn't ubiquitous. And so, CNN, mainstream, uh, well, cable news network, was used to distribute this, this image and these, these pictures. Um, but still, if this citizen hadn't filmed this footage, would we even know who Rodney King is? Would we have had the discussions that followed in relation to appropriate use of, of police force, uh, force by police services, racial profiling, um, and uh, also the, the, the judicial system um, in the US in terms of, of, uh, of how this case was handled. So we have here, this is some early mobile media, but we're still relying on mainstream media to distribute the images. Uh, and, uh, uh, this is sort of a pre-video on the internet type of era. I want to fast forward now um, to last year. You know, unfortunately, a very similar situation. Um, this was uh, Eric Gardner, a uh, man in New York City. Uh, police were stopping him. Apparently, he was selling like cigarettes on a street corner. Apparently, uh, and. Uh, they restrained him, and he ended up um, uh, dying from his uh, his uh, his restraint. 
Um, and in this case, this was not recorded on VHS. It was recorded on someone's, uh, um, a well, Ramsey Orta's uh, cell phone. Um, so, you know, uh, if, if in 2014 we, was, we were still using large VHS video cameras, um, it's possible that, uh, well, it's less likely, I would say, that, that this image would have been um, uh, captured if maybe Ramsey wasn't already on his way to film a, a wedding reception or something, or uh, uh, on tour with, with family. So the fact that, as, as you've illustrated today, many of you have some sort of device. If you don't own it, you can borrow it uh, from friends or family. The fact that you have these, these mobile devices on you at all times often. How many, how many of you here uh, put your phone beside your bed when you go to bed at night? Okay. And how many of you leave it on? Okay, <laughs> and we'll, we'll just leave it there. We won't get into bathroom uh, editing in there, but, but it's really, it, it is quite ubiquitous, right? It's, it, it's on all the time, and we're always in contact, and when we're out of contact, it's, it's kind of freaky. Um, so I'll get myself back on track here, but thank you. I mean, that's the fact that, you know, if, if, our, if our phones were still those brick cell phones, would we carry them with us as much as we do now? I, uh, I know I wouldn't. Um, so, uh, okay, and then the other part of the puzzle here, or the um, growth of ubiquitous mobile media, is uh, the internet, right? The fact that uh, Ramsey Orta, um, in many cases, a lot of phones now, you can, you can immediately stream uh, video to the internet from your mobile device. So you don't need mainstream media. Um, you're still dealing with media companies that are now rivaling mainstream media, the likes of Google and others. However, my, my point here is that we've got uh, uh, a very uh, small size, portable media devices and the ability to connect to the internet. So what's happening here is we've got mobile media devices, cameras, cell phones, tablets, plus the internet equals what a theorist Lev Manovich refers to as media conversations. So a media conversation is, is a conversation like hopefully we'll have uh, in this class today. Um, but it's through, through media, through, in this case, video and still images uh, that uh, citizens have recorded and are sharing and that often come in conflict with official media sources, whether that's a CC, uh, closed caption television camera in the street, uh, a, uh, a police dash camera, or increasingly police body cameras. So our goal for today, our objective is that by the end of the class, you'll be able to demonstrate an understanding of the relationship between ubiquitous mobile media, our phone always by our bed, sending out, well, I guess it's not transmitting unless you're on a call, hopefully, but we've got our phones next to our beds. What is the impact of, of ubiquitous mobile media and civil liberties? And as we talked about in an earlier class, civil liberties, we don't really hear about them, or people don't really seem to cherish them, or at least talk about them as much maybe in Canada as in the United States. But civil liberties, as we discussed previously, are these sort of basic human rights, uh, rights to uh, free speech, rights of assembly, freedom of religion. In Canada, we have a charter of rights and freedoms. So when we have ubiquitous mobile media, what is the relationship? between ubiquitous mobile media and the state of civil liberties. This is a, a Canadian example of, of ubiquitous mobile media capturing an event. Uh, and um, Sammy Yatim was on a streetcar in Toronto, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was not having a good evening. Uh, the police intervened. 
ended up tasering and shooting uh, Yatim. He did not live, unfortunately. But Martin Barron was coming home from uh, having dinner in Little Italy in Toronto. And because he had his phone on him, like he did every day, I imagine, and because he could get onto the internet, he was able to capture this image and upload it to YouTube and start a conversation. We've got a really excellent case study uh, happening right now in Toronto, where the Toronto police, uh, some of you may have heard, have 100 body cameras that they're trying out. And the idea here, according to the police, is that uh, police officers will, um, this will reduce stress and maybe make their job safer also. And as we talked about earlier, on the flip side, there's a hope that somehow civilians will be safer and less stressful, having less stress in their lives if, if cameras are being worn by the police. So, our task today, I'd like you as media theorists to provide recommendations to the Toronto City Council with respect to the possible long-term adoption of body cameras by the Toronto Police. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd like you to split into two groups. Uh, if you don't mind, I guess, uh, uh, Group A on the left here. I'd like you to provide three ways that police body cameras will improve policing in Toronto. Group B to the right, please provide three ways that the uh, police cameras will worsen policing in Toronto. I'll just give you a minute. And uh, if you could elect a, uh, a note taker, which some of you have already done, and elect a presenter, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, I, I'll, I get to be Toronto City Council, so uh, you don't have to stand up, but you're, you're welcome to if you like. Um, if Group A, if the, the uh, improved policing, uh, if you could offer your three recommendations. So we strongly believe that it's a really good thing that there is um, cameras being used by Toronto police officers for the following reasons. Um, citizens might feel safer um, actually approaching police officers knowing that there is evidence of what's happening in that interaction. So I would feel a lot safer to do that. Uh, there's also, oh, what else? yeah, so just more accountability, both on the part of the system and the police officer, because they know that the, you know, it's not going to be a who said what sort of situation. There's will be the physical evidence, so people are hopefully will hold themselves to a higher standard, both the citizen and the police officer. And we also um, believe that as opposed to having snapshots of what happened, bits and pieces, there is actually that one conclusive video that can show the entire interaction as well. So I think that would definitely increase uh, or improve policing in the city. Great. Excellent uh, observation and, and ideas. Uh, go ahead, uh, Group B. So we figure um, that the... Um, Group B being uh, that, that the cameras will, will worsen police. Right. So that the police officers are going to be afraid or fear of blaming using force, even when they need to use force, that people are going to blame them, that it's, right, uh, it wasn't, uh, they shouldn't have used There's two things here. Are you frightened of using force? Also, fear of being blamed. Right. Yeah. Okay. And the other? 
Uh, and and I think uh, you had this one. Uh, police feel that they're controlled now, that there's no sort of, he said, sort of like robotic. And like, do we police are depersonalized now? Do we feel like a watch or computers other than humans? Okay, they're becoming robotic almost, yeah. or machines. Okay, excellent feedback. Please keep an eye on this case study. It'd be interesting to see if the Toronto Police do adopt the cameras. Um, just to summarize here, ubiquitous mobile media, as we've discussed, does provide opportunity for the democratization of media, that, that everybody hopefully will have a chance to have these media conversations. However, if we think that somehow just putting cameras on police is going to solve everything, that's something that would be called techno deterministic, which is uh, sort of a long word for um, an idea that, or a suggestion that somehow technology will like make us do things and, ch and change us. And uh, uh, these are uh, things to be uh, conscious of. And like I said, please uh, please keep an eye on that on that case study. Thank you very much. Great uh, great feedback. Thank you.